Okay. Um, but I, so what I have in front of me is a course website that is uh, now those of you who've taken the 460 from me, you can just change 460 to 461 in the URL, and this site comes up. Um, but I'll, I'll be sending any relevant information by email. Um, also, since we have uh, people at uh, two campuses, um, and what I just handed out to you, the uh, schedule and syllabus, all of that is uh, uh, duplicated here. Um, do you think you guys here would see better if any of the lights were off? Or do you, I don't know if you want to try that. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, go ahead and give that a try and see what's better. Yeah. OK. All right. Um, yep, that does look better. OK. So um, now for the uh, schedule, we have everything here. Actually, there's even more information on this one than there is on the um, one I handed out because it has the uh, homework due dates um, on it. Um, and generally, homeworks will be due on Wednesdays. Uh, now, because there's MATLAB code involved, um, homework might as well be submitted by email. Um, that's just safer because if it's you know, the part that's written is done on paper, I might lose it. Um, so this way, uh, easier to keep track of everything. So, uh, so, so not all Wednesdays, but most um, there'll be so a total of nine uh, homeworks, and there will be one in-class test on a on the only day during the semester that I'll be traveling. Uh, for the 26th, because I can't trust a sub to do anything but proctor a test. Yes? Oh, oh um, what, what did you have? Uh, is it math.usm.e slash, slash math461? Okay. Got it. What? Okay. That's really possible. <laughs> okay. Um. <clears throat> okay, and. Um, so unless there's some something catastrophic like a tornado or something, this is the schedule. This is what we're doing every day. And if God forbid something happens, because well, we have tornadoes here like every four years, so it's not time yet. Um, next year, um, so hopefully we can stay on schedule. Um, okay. So you said there's only one inland test. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now. Um, okay. So here's all the usual info, um, and the book, which you probably already have from before. Um, okay. And uh, okay. So, so what? So what? What we have from the coursework right here. Um, and those of you who've taken 460 from me would be familiar with this um, already. Um, that there will be uh, Canvas quizzes given in Canvas that are on uh, what are called concept check questions in the book that uh, deal with definitions, concept, essential concepts, things like that. Um, so the questions themselves are are already in the book, but they're posted or replicated um, in Canvas. Uh, so actually, I have Canvas up here, over here. Okay. Oh, let me make this bigger. Okay. Well, Canvas has been a pain because this is one course of three sections. There's uh, undergrads Coast, undergrads Hattiesburg, and then graduate students uh, Hattiesburg. Um, so if I update one of them, I have to update all of them. They're not synchronized. Okay, so I'll just uh, pick one here. So in Canvas, if you go down uh, to the appropriate course for you, the left side we have quizzes. And here are all the quizzes. Um, so you can 
um, go ahead and uh, uh, take them from here. Um, and those will be graded um, in Canvas. Now, for those of you who took 460 with me last semester, quizzes were kind of lumped into the homeworks. They're, they're not this time. Uh, so quizzes are a separate um, item uh, with their, their own, due own due dates and their own portion of the grade. Um, OK, so 10% so for the uh, quizzes. Um, and then there'll be homework assignments. These are taken from a book. So those are the explorations um, from the various chapters that um, I'll be covering. Uh, 20% uh, lowest one drops. So there'll be nine of those assignments altogether. Um, OK, the um, in-class midterm that I mentioned uh, earlier, although it's definitely not at the middle of a term. It's closer to the beginning of a term because um, that was convenient scheduling. Um, and then, okay, so the final is going to be kind of weird because I never felt right giving an in-class test on this material. Um, the, the questions I thought of just didn't seem feasible. Um, so you have a, a choice. Uh, one choice is um, a uh, oral final exam that is uh, comprehensive, so you know, take about an hour or so uh, during finals week or shortly before then, whatever we can schedule, uh, where I'm asking you conceptual questions spanning the material of the course, possibly having you work something out on the board. Um, and uh, the other option is I have a coding project that's actually already posted on the um, assignments page uh, down here. Uh, so I'll, I need to update those directions for, for this year. But um, so with a, so it's a MATLAB coding assignment, um, and that it actually deals with the last material that's covered in the class on uh, solving two-point boundary value problems. Um, when I did this last time, most actually chose the oral because it seems students are, are that scared of coding. So um, I th yeah, I think really like. Two of them did the coding project, so we'll see how that goes. But up to you. Um, so with the board, would you like ask us individually to do project on the board, or? Um, yes, in, yeah, as so I meet with each of you, because there's not too many of you, so it's right. something that's feasible. <coughs> yeah. Um, OK. Um, so, so that's how the uh, <coughs> uh, grade is determined. OK. Um, all right, and um, so as far as what's going to be covered, so what's, 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 so what's going to be going to be interesting is, um, you know, all of you have uh, have taken 460, but done it during different years. Um, so several of you just took it last semester uh, with me. Um, you took it over two years ago. Uh, you took it with, so, so, with someone else, <laughs> so, um, and uh, um, so hopefully everything works as far as what material is covered. Because uh, if, if during a year that I'm not teaching it, either Dr. Chen or Dr. Tian teaches it, and so the mix of material might be different. Um, so hopefully there's not some big gap or worse repetition. Um, so what will be covered? Um, the first part of a course is uh, gets into numerical linear algebra, um, so it's sort of like a forerunner to uh, another graduate course in the uh, su subject that's uh, Math 610 that's more advanced. So we get into solving systems of linear equations, uh, direct methods here, uh, for, uh, also from some special cases. Um, and while you would recognize certain things from a ordinary linear algebra course, here we're taking computer arithmetic into account, which changes the method somewhat. Um, and then, uh, and that gets into also estimating and proving accuracy, where we have to take that into account even further. Um, also, iterative methods, a whole other class of methods for solving linear systems of equations that uh, is probably never covered in a uh, linear algebra course. Um, and then from there, um, now chapter, so that's chapters three and five. Chapter 10, that's something I actually covered last semester, um, solving nonlinear equations. Um, but uh, in a previous instance of 460, it, 
it uh, wasn't. I'm going to review some of that chapter because there's been plenty of time to forget it and we actually need it for the stuff that comes next. Uh, because this was solving one nonlinear equation, uh, then we're going to spend some time on what if you're solving a system nonlinear equation. So you, you want to find a zero of a function of several variables instead of just one. Um, and then you'll have spring break, so you'll have a chance to forget all of that um, <laughs> before we pick it up again here. Um, and then we get, and the rest of the semester is all about differential equations. How do we numerically solve differential equations? Starting with um, initial value problems, like the pro problems that would have come up in the Math 285, for instance, um, and various methods for solving those. And then we conclude the semester with two-point boundary value problems, so differential equations of second order on an interval where you have a boundary condition specified um, at each end. Okay. Um, so, um, so, this, so this builds on things that were covered in 460, which dealt with polynomial interpolation, numerical differentiation, uh, numerical integration. So we're going to um, use some of these things uh, uh, here. Okay. Now, um, okay. I think I got. All right. Um, so, are there any questions about how the course will be run? More tactical difficulties? Or? Yes, I've been quietly having the same problem as you had earlier. But I'm, I'm in wrong, but I'm Oh. I should have spoke up earlier, but you know, I'm kind of stuck. Okay. Are you still not there? I don't know what it is. You know, Matt's At one moment. Okay, so I went. So I Googled it, like she said. And <laughs> Earlier, your page came up, but not the particular class. Oh, um, and now the page is. Okay, I'll tell you to Google instead. Go back to Google. Yes. Um, get rid of the H in the map. Okay, and put a space in there. Oh. Now that's the one you want. But is that not the same thing? Uh, oh, no S. It's HTTP. That's that's why. Oh. Uh, uh, your page. Does anyone who wants to be on my side, on my side? Okay, you got it. All right. Well, that was fun.
Okay. Um, now, and all of that's immortalized on YouTube as well. Um, okay. Now, the other thing that I'll be do, uh, doing besides uh, you know, posting the videos from this, um, probably like shortly after class, because I'll still be here for a period of time after class, so I can get the upload going. The other thing, and, and those of you who were with me last semester um, would uh, remember this. So I'll have uh, these uh, notes that I'll type up, because even though we have a book, I, this way I can take into account um, any uh, questions that, that people have. Um, so um, since it's, unfortunately, I prefer to write on a board, but in this room, just not feasible. Um, so this is the next best thing where I'll be able to write out my equations um, in proper, ma proper mathematical notation um, and uh, renders it on the fly. Now, those of you who have seen me do this before remember me complaining about it, and that'll still happen, so just deal with it. Um, but we'll, we'll get everything up. And these also will be posted um, after class um, each day. Okay. Um, so, so I'll be going back and forth between typing in here and also, uh, not today, but most days, doing some kind of uh, MATLAB demonstration. Um, as far as the first assignments, so the way assignments will work, uh, okay, so you see the due dates here. So once uh, I finish covering a section, um, then you know, make sure to give a little time, and then um, the assignment will be due on whatever Wednesday follows that. So the first assignment on section 3.1, uh, that's what I'm covering today. And, oh, I actually give two Wednesdays away for that. Okay. <laughs> so I guess you have plenty of time to uh, get your feet wet. Um, but remember, we've got something of regularity um, each week. Okay. Um, now, okay. Um, but also, keep in mind the quizzes. So, um, so the way quizzes work, we see it, um, once I finish covering a section, or whatever sections will be on the quiz, um, then the quiz will be due the next class day after that. Um, so, for example, sections 3.3 three and 3.4, um, I finish covering... Wait a minute. Okay. That's totally... That's the wrong date for this. <laughs> um, okay. I'm going to have to adjust this date. Um, that's supposed to be due the 19th. And I thought I'd already done that. Okay. Okay, but the um, all right, so first quiz is coming up due um, a week from today. Um, three point three and three point four. Although this updates it only for Hattiesburg undergraduates, I still need to go to the other ones and fix that. But I'll I'll fix that tonight. <laughs> of the quiz due dates. Okay, so the bottom line is, you have nothing to do for a week. <laughs> All right, so, as I was mentioned earlier, um, okay, so we have um, All right. Uh, so solving systems of linear equations of a form A x is equal to B where A is a square invertible matrix. Um, so, um, so in other words, a system that has a unique solution because uh, there are also cases of uh, solving system linear equations where it's known that there's no solution. You try to find the closest possible solution or one that's underdetermined where there's infinitely many solutions and you want one that satisfies a certain criterion. Uh, but we're not doing that here. We're just dealing with a case where there's a unique solution by two types of methods. Uh, 
direct methods, and by that I mean Gaussian elimination, and certain variations that we'll see for certain special cases. So this is what you learn about in an ordinary first linear algebra course. Um, so something that's familiar to you. Like, in other words, reducing to rho echelon form. Um, we don't use these all those hokey pure, pure math terms in here, but that's what's happening. Um, and iterative um, methods as well. Um, okay, and then the uh, uh, second part is um, solving systems of nonlinear equations by fixed point iteration and Newton's method. So uh, most of you have seen these for a single equation. In case you haven't, um, like in 2017, 460, I did not cover those. Um, there will be a review. Um, and then initial value problems for ODEs. Uh, so time stepping methods. Um, and finally, two points boundary value problems for ODEs. Um, and as, uh, as for where all this is in the book, um, so chapter three for direct methods, iterative methods are covered in chapter five, but we're only doing a um, portion of that chapter in this class. You want to rest, take 610 if you're a grad student. Uh, systems nonlinear equation, that is chapter 11. Um, initial value problems, chapter 12. And then chapter 13 um, is a boundary value problem. So we make it almost all the way to the end of a book. If you want the end of a book, you take Math 721 if you're a graduate student. It's key thing about this, this book. It serves four classes. <coughs> okay. Now, um, so what I'm going to cover today in the... I have until I have, I have 50 minutes left. Um, okay, so and let's B be uh, a dimensional. I want to emphasize here uh, column vector. Um, so by default, any vectors that um, I use here. We will think of them as column vectors. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the problem that we're interested in solving here is find the unique x such that a x is equal to b. Okay. Um, and it's known when a is invertible. Um, yeah, we do have a formula. For x, um, x is equal to um, I need my dollar signs in here for math mode. Okay, um, so x is given by a inverse b. Uh, so the goal is to compute that. Now, uh, if you remember your first linear algebra course, so here it's math three twenty six or whatever counterpart you took elsewhere. Um, I know in Math 326 here, um, what the students are having spend, uh, I think like weeks doing, is computing the inverse of a matrix. So you're doing all these row operations, and you have like, um, you, you, you write down your matrix on one side, you write identity on the other side, you do all these row operations to transform A into the identity, and then the identity becomes the inverse. Um, and then once you have that, then you can just compute this and bam, you have your solution. Um, now, um, in a class where you work things out by hand, um, that's all fine and dandy. But um, so I want to point out here, although um, uh, we can use methods um, from solving 
such systems by hand on a computer as well, it's not exactly the same. Um, so I want to point out a few a few differences before I get into the nitty gritty. Okay. Um, so first, um, efficiency actually matters. Um, we, we are going to the goal is to solve this system a x equals b by performing as few arithmetic operations as possible. Um, and because of that, we have one rule here. Never, ever, 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 ever. Is that enough emphasis for you? Explicitly compute A inverse. Uh, we do not solve, even though that is a formula for B inverse, and it can be useful in analytical settings, uh, not computationally. Um, and the reason for that um, um, there's a couple reasons. So, so, so first, um, it requires um, four times as many um, arithmetic operations, arithmetic operations, um, and it's generally less accurate. Because when it's the computer that's doing the work, um, every single arithmetic operation you perform has some error involved. If you're going to perform more operations, you're giving more of a chance for error uh, to accumulate. Um, so technically something can be done, like in MATLAB, there's a command that will give you the inverse matrix, and it will warn you not to use it for solving um, uh, AX equals B. Um, OK. Um, so that's one thing that's uh, uh, different. Another difference is, um, when using the familiar process of Gaussian elimination, the reason for inter one of the operations you can perform on a system of equations is you can interchange rows. So for inter interchanging rows is, uh, is different. Uh, so by hand, goal is to avoid dividing by zero. Um, so you're trying to uh, reduce the system to row echelon form, and sometimes you can't do that unless you do some row swapping to avoid a division by zero. Um, on a computer, that reason still applies, um, but is, the goal is also to reduce uh, rounding error from computer arithmetic. Um, so um, so a lot more um, row swapping goes on than when doing it uh, by hand. Um, and one more consideration. A lot of times a uh, way a system is solved by hand is to do it in such a way to avoid fractions, to have a number work out nicely. That definitely doesn't apply here. Um, so it's just, it's just not going to happen. Um, it doesn't need to happen. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, and there's going to be more differences that we'll see as we go. Um, but um, so as a, but as a reminder, uh, I remember giving a message in Math 460. Um, but criteria for a numerical algorithm are following. Uh, so accuracy, of course, efficiency, as I've mentioned, and robustness. We want the answer to be reliable. Um, so in some cases, solving A equals B is what is called an ill-conditioned problem. A small change in a problem could lead to a large change in solution. That's something that poses a lot of difficulty um, for numerical methods. And that's a pro property of the underlying problem, um, not the method used to solve it. Um, but making a judicious choice of method can help to uh, um, uh, con contain the error somewhat. <clears throat> OK. Um, so 
So these are things we're going to keep in mind when uh, going through this. Okay, <clears throat> now, so if we have A being any n by n invertible matrix, um, the goal is to develop some method that's going to solve the system A equals B. Now, to design an algorithm solving A x equals B, in the general case, so A, A is any invertible matrix, there's two questions that need to be answered. And these kind of questions are useful in developing all kinds of numerical algorithms. So this is just one example. Okay, so what we do is first answer this question. Okay, which cases is a problem in some sense easy to solve? So is there a particular class of matrices for which we can easily solve AX equals B. So we work that out first. Um, and then once that's done, how can we reduce a general case to one of these uh, easy cases? So how can we capitalize um, on that? So how, how can we transform the original problem into an equivalent problem that can be, that, uh, can be solved more easily? Okay, so, so now what I'll do is take a look at some cases of system of equations that are uh, relatively easy to solve. And that takes me to what is called uh, tri uh, triangular systems. Okay, so All right, and we have three types of uh, such systems. So a diagonal system is a system in which all of the equations are independent of one another. So it would look something like this. So I have uh, a one one x is equal to, or x one is equal to b one. And I keep going. Oops, something went wrong there. Okay, um, so what we have here is in each one of these equations, the x's are unknown. So x1, x2, xn are all the elements of x. Um, so, so each of these unknowns is involved in only one equation. Uh, there's no coupling here among them. Um, so, so what would um, each one of these x's be equal to? What would the solution be? Like just one, comp just any one, what? Yeah, so xi would be bi over, over aii. Assuming that all these a's are not zero, at least, which we'll assume here. Um, okay, so, so this system is a di called a diagonal system because a is a diagonal matrix. So the form that it has
And something went very wrong. Oh, okay. Okay. So we have A or one. All right, so the entries of a matrix are just the ones that sit on the main diagonal. Everything else in the matrix is zero. Uh, so, so generally when I'm doing a matrix like this, if I have blank space, it's assumed that what's out there is in that blank space is zero. Um, so, um, so certainly this system of equations is, uh, is uh, quite trivial to solve. So we can, we can take a general system of equations any invertible matrix and reduce it to a diagonal matrix, um, then then we're certainly home free. Um, now, so all we're doing here is we're doing this for each component of a solution, x1, x2, etc., up to xn. So in the end, what we have is, so this, so solving this system requires only n um, so floating point arithmetic operations. Um, okay. Now, um, okay. So, so that's so that's, so that's the most trivial case. Now we're going to look at the case that is, well, also simpler than a general case, not quite um, as trivial. Um, is not diagonal. Um, has non-zero entries only above main diagonal. So in other words, um, it's still zero below. Um, so I'll give an example of a, a system of equations. I'll just make one up here. Um, okay. Um, Oh, dang. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's not... This is not supposed to be there. Okay. And finally... Whoops. Okay. So what we have here is a uh, system of equations. So the, if I were to write the matrix of this system, it would have two minus six and nine on the diagonal. And then I have these entries. Um, so in this system, So my entries are 2, minus 3, 4, and I have uh, 0, minus 6, 7, and then 0, 0, 9. Um, so this is, um, so this is an upper triangular matrix. So all entries um, below the main diagonal are uh, equal to zero. Now, from looking at this system written in the original form, we can see how we can go ahead and solve it because any time we have a situation where one equation is independent of the others, um, we can go ahead and solve that equation and use that. So, um, okay. So how can we proceed to solve this? Which which of these equations can we just go ahead and solve right off the bat?
Yeah, so what do we do with the bottom one? Um, yeah, so we can just go ahead and divide. So first, we solve the uh, last equation. So x3 would be, so just dividing this right-hand side value 10 um, by the uh, diagonal entry 9. Um, now, um, so now that we have x3, what can we do next? Because... Um, with the other equations, they involve multiple unknowns. But now that we know x3, what can we do? Yeah, we, so, so now, yes, yeah, so next we can substitute x3 into the second equation, which then isolates x2. Um, so I'm going to write out, uh, now, I'm not going to jump all the way to the final value of x2. I want to show you the expression for x2, because that is what leads us to a general method. So x2, um, <coughs> we're going to, so the idea is we take the known value of x3, substitute it in here, and then one x2, so I need to take this term, 7x3, and move it to the other side. So, so what's going to happen is, I'm going to start with, this value on the right hand side, the minus 8, and then I'm going to subtract this matrix entry, the 7, times x3, which is known, so I could just plug that in here, and then I divide that by whatever is multiplying x2, so that would be the minus 6. Okay. <clears throat> so x3, we take the right hand side entry, divide by the diagonal entry. Here, too, same thing. Right-hand side entry divided by diagonal entry. Those two things show up in both. But here we have something extra. We also have to take this term, move it over. Okay. Um, so finally, we can substitute x3 that we got earlier and x2 that we have now. into the first equation. And that's going to give us x1. Now, so what will happen here is we substitute an x2, x3, because those are known. Again, move these to the other side. So as our starting point, we're going to have this right-hand side value that was sitting here, and these terms subtracted from it, and then to isolate x1, we have to divide by the diagonal entry. So that's going to give us So 5 minus minus 3 times x2. Okay. And then minus this term, the 4x3, all over whatever is multiplying x1. So that would be the diagonal entry 2. Um, okay. So, so what... So if we want to um, extrapolate from this to a general purpose method, how's that going to go? We're always going to use the right-hand side value. So for each unknown, <laughs> x1, x2, x3, first we're going to proceed backwards. And then we're going to start with the right-hand side value, then subtract off terms that involve multiplying, <coughs> bless you, unknowns we've previously computed times matrix entries from this upper triangle here. Subtract those off. Once that's done, we divide by uh, the diagonal entry. Now, this process is called back substitution um, because we're going to start from the last equation and work our way backwards. Okay. Now, I'm going to flip here to the book and show how this process that we've seen carried out for this example manifests itself in a general purpose algorithm. Well, first, from diagonal systems earlier, this is something that could be translated into MATLAB without too much difficulty. Here, a diagonal system, we're just performing these n divisions. So we have, so what I showed you earlier, bi over aii, we just do that in a loop. So same idea with back substitution which is 
right here. So, so here we have so the system. Now my notation's a little different. I have a x equals b before. Now I have u to refer to an upper triangular matrix. The right hand side that was called b before is called y here. And the reason for that to be clear is we develop a general purpose algorithm for uh, systems. The solution is still called x. Now, this is a good time to recall a little anecdote from a friend of mine who's a faculty member at Stanford who uh, teaches this kind of material also. Uh, because, so she's teaching all about solving linear systems just like I am, and then gives a midterm exam. Um, and so some students came up to her afterwards very upset uh, because, in their words, you know, she spent all this time teaching about how to solve ax equals b, and she put a problem on the test asking to solve cx equals d. Don't be that math student. <laughs> um, and I've seen this happen often in my own class as well, where once a letter is used for a particular purpose, for example, u with u substitution in, in uh, Cal 2 evaluating integrals, that seems to be bound to that purpose for all time. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so let's keep that in mind as we look at this algorithm. So, so the thing is, we're going to compute these unknowns, you know, x1, x2, all the way up to xn, but that's our output, but we have to work backwards. So, that's what happens here. We have a loop that starts at the ending value, n, and will count down to 1. Um, so then, uh, to carry out the process that I showed you here, notice we always start at the right-hand side value, and we're subtracting off an increasing number of terms. So we set our unknown equal to the right-hand side value as a starting point. So like, we have a minus 8 here and a 5 here. It's the same idea. Then um, we iterate over all the entries in that upper triangle that are in the same row. Now, um, in this case, like in, this, in, the, in the third row, we, we, we want to look at all the entries to the right of a diagonal entry in that row. Here, the last row, we don't have any such entries, so we don't do anything. Here we have one entry in the second row, and when we get to the first row, we have two entries that are to the right of a diagonal. So whatever index, row index we're in, like this is a 1-1 one, one entry, 2-2 two, two entry, 3-3 three, three entry, we're going to start with column indices that are strictly greater to loop over this portion of, of a row um, or this portion of this row. So that's why um, in this loop, we're this part here is about subtracting off terms. So we start to immediately to the right of a diagonal and we and we go all the way to the end. And we take our right-hand side value and we keep subtracting off matrix entries times previously computed unknowns. So what we see here, like the minus 7x3 or in the subtracting off a minus 3x2 and a 4x3, that's what's happening in this inner loop right here. And then um, once that's done, what is the very last step we see here? We're always dividing by a diagonal entry, and that's what happens here. Um, so this algorithm here carries out the process that I worked through um, in that example. Okay. Um, so once you have an idea of how to work something out by hand, but you want to um, now implement this um, in MATLAB, um, so any, anytime you're carrying out some sort of uh, repeated process like that, this it's going to lead to a loop. Um, in this case, we had to subtract off an increasing number of terms. First it was zero terms, then one term, then two terms. And that's why this inner loop has a variable starting point. Um, so it starts at i plus 1, counts all the way up uh, to n. Second last line, uh, by uii. Yeah, so dividing by the diagonal entry. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, as you can tell, compared to um, solving a diagonal system, this is obviously more work. Um, 
because and we, we see we have two loops nested within each other. Um, so in fact, you can show um, that this algorithm requires n squared. Um, operations uh, for solving an n by n system, whereas it was only n operations for um, for a diagonal system, so a whole order of magnitude greater. Uh, but that's still negligible compared to the cost of solving a general um, n by n system. Okay. So, any questions about why this works or how it comes from the example? <clears throat> okay. Now, there's one other kind of uh, system that I won't take much time to talk about now, but I, I will later. Um, so it's very so forward substitution. So similar to upper triangular systems, a matrix is um, lower triangular. If all entries above the main diagonal um, are zero, so so the idea is if I take this kind of system and write the equations in reverse order um, uh, and like re and like reverse all the unknowns, I'd have a lower triangular system. It's just the opposite situation. Uh, so in this case, the first equation can be solved immediately. Uh, then you substitute that into the second equation and so on. Um, so the algorithm for this kind of system is forward substitution. I won't spend much time on it now just because it's almost exactly the same process. You're just doing things in reverse order from a back substitution. Uh, but, but it's something I will spend more time on in the next topic when I get to the LU decomposition. Um, okay, so so it requires. I'm going to say big O of n squared floating point arithmetic operations. Um, now here I have big O of n squared as opposed to saying exactly n squared. Um, so what really what this means is the number of operations can be bounded by a constant times n squared. Um, uh, I, I believe the exact count is something like it's like n squared minus n. Um, so I was being lazy here. Um, so oftentimes, uh, when I describe the complexity of an algorithm, um, we have uh, it would be expressed this way using big O notation. Um, so we'll see other algorithms that are in the order n cubed, for instance. But some, so sometimes we'll actually be interested in a more precise expression for um, uh, for the operation count. For example, Gaussian elimination, the number of operations is 2 thirds n cubed plus lower order terms that uh, we're going to uh, going to neglect. Um, but this big notation here and how we use it in this class, it's just meant to convey order of magnitude of the work to be done. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so, so this is an example right here of a lower triangular uh, matrix. And so all entries above a main diagonal are zero. So you can see from here why we can solve a first equation right away, substitute that into the second one, and then get the second unknown immediately, and, and so forth. Just, just to reverse it back substitution. Okay. <clears throat> okay. What I want to spend the rest of the time on is um, the general case. So, so given algorithms for forward and back substitution, how can we solve a general system? A x equals b. So now, a is expected to be invertible. Still, um, 
Um, but it no longer has a triangular structure. Um, so um, by performing operations on the system ax equals b that do not change the solution, um, the lead to the system having a triangular structure. Okay, so. There are three kinds of operations. Um, okay. This is where this LaTeX editor is not cooperating with me. Okay. Um, these are called from linear algebra class elementary row operations um, that leave the, the, the solution unchanged. Um, so we have uh, so scaling a row of the system. So we multiply both sides of a row by a particular constant. Um, that does not change the solution. Um, now I mention this only because. That is one of the types of elementary row operations as mentioned in any linear algebra course. We're actually not going to need it um, in what we're doing. Because um, often it can be made to have a, make a, an equation nicer, like maybe make a coefficient equal to one. On a computer, you don't really care about that. Um, secondly, uh, interchanging rows of a system. Um, so if you swap both sides of uh, two rows, certainly that's not going to change the uh, solution. And then so that one's going to be important to us. And then finally, the most important is um, adding or subtracting a multiple of one row uh, from another. Uh, so you're just um, linearly combining uh, two equations. Uh, so because it's linear, that also is not going to uh, change the solution. Okay. Um, so, so what we can do um, is use these row operations to reduce um, a, uh, a general invertible matrix A to upper triangular form. Okay, so, so how do we go about doing that? Um, Okay. Mm. Let's see what I have here. Mm. Okay, do I want this one? All right. So now, what you learn to do in a linear algebra class is solve what's called the augmented work of the aug augmented matrix. You have your matrix A, on the left side of the system. And then you throw in B as an extra column. So then you can perform row operations on both uh, simultaneously. It's just a notational convenience, really. Um, so we have this example uh, system here. Um, so the augmented matrix would be all the coefficients of the x's here. Uh, so the coefficient matrix A. And then the right-hand side B slapped together. And then we have this um, augmented matrix that we can perform uh, row operations on. So the idea is we want to perform row operations that will reduce A to upper triangular form. Because once it's a system's upper triangular, you can just do back substitution, which is one reason why I'm not really talking about forward substitution right now. Because um, really, the only substitution we need in this case is backward substitution. So if I perform operations on A, to make it upper triangular, but I include B as an extra column, those row operations are automatically being performed on B also. So we end up with an equivalent with both sides in an equivalent system in this augmented matrix. So the idea is if I want to reduce this matrix, makes it a little bigger, to upper triangular form, um, 
I need to eliminate, I mean, take all the entries that are below the main diagonal. So the 3, 1, and 5 here, the 4 and 5 here, and then the 1 down here. I need to perform manipulations that will make those entries 0. So, so what I can do is, I can do this in an orderly fashion. Because um, that's how I would implement it on a computer anyway. So I can start with, I can go column by column. First column, then second column, then third column. Um, I don't need to touch the fourth column because in an upper triangular matrix, the last column is going to have all non-zero entries anyway. <coughs> so, okay. So if I want to, uh, so the idea is I'm going to take multiples of this first row and subtract them from the rows below to get rid of everything in this first column that's below it. Um, so, so how can I do that? What I can do is I can take this row and divide it by this diagonal entry, the 2. That way, the first entry of this row is now equal to 1. <clears throat> then I multiply it by the entry I'm trying to eliminate. In this case, I'm trying to eliminate the 3. So in other words, if I take this first row and multiply it by three halves, now I have a row I can subtract from the second row where the first entry is equal to three, and by subtracting, they cancel. So, um, so that's how I can get rid of this entry right here. To get rid of the next entry, the one, I can divide by the diagonal entry, the two, and then multiply by the entry I want to eliminate, which is the 1. So I'm multiplying the first row by 1 half, and I subtract, and again this causes cancellation. Now, I'm going to write this out, write out what I was just saying here. Okay, um, okay so to eliminate an entry aij, um, using row j, where i is greater than j. Um, we need to find right multiple of row j to subtract from row i. Now, the reason why I say i is greater than j is because we want to matrix, make a matrix upper triangular. In an upper triangular matrix, um, aij is 0, wherever i is greater than j. So when the row is greater than the column, that's where you're down here, in this lower triangle. That's why we want to get rid of. So, um, So if I use the variable k as a column index, all right, so I want to eliminate, because uh, the thing is, keep in mind, I'm trying to eliminate this entry. But if I want to eliminate this entry, I'm adding a, by subtracting a multiple of the first row from a row down here, it affects the entire row. So, so this entry in row i is going to be equal to itself minus some quantity mij that I'm going to call the multiplier. So it's whatever we multiply row j by to subtract from row i. Now, um, and I call it mij, m for multiplier, and the ij because ij is the entry we want to get rid of. And then we have multiply that by a jk. All right. So we do this for all column indices. So we're subtracting all of row j times this multiplier from row i. Um, all 
Now, so how do we choose this entry? Now, I explained it in the example, but I want to show you in general. Um, because we need to ensure aij is equal to 0, I'm going to set k equal j through here. So I have aij, which is equal to itself, minus mij ajj is equal to 0. Um, so now what I can do, so this is the new aij, which will be 0. So I need this to be 0. So I can solve this equation for the multiplier. So, so multiply mij is equal to aij, the entry you want to eliminate, divided by the diagonal entry in the same column. Um, now that better be non-zero. Um, if, if not, that's when some kind of row interchange is necessary. And that's something we'll talk more about uh, later on. Um, well, okay, if I take this, this part right here, so I'm solving this equation for mij. So I got to move this to the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a multiplier right here. Um, so now what I can do, um, if I show you, so, so that's the piece we need for the algorithm. So this is how gas elimination works on the augmented matrix. So as I mentioned before, we're going to do this orderly fashion. We're going to start with um, the first column and keep going from left to right. So column one, column two, all the way up to all columns except the last one, because we don't need to eliminate anything in the last column. So J, I'm since customarily I refers to rows, J refers to columns, so I'm, I'm going by column here. So, uh, so everything inside here that I've just highlighted, that will, um, that handles column J completely. So now, um, I have to, I'm all, only trying to eliminate entries below the diagonal, row greater than column. So I starts counting from J plus 1, goes all the way down to N. Um, so inside here, everything I've just highlighted now, that's meant to work on eliminating a particular entry IJ. It's performing one row operation. So first, get the multiplier using a formula that I just derived. Then this innermost loop here that I've just highlighted, that actually carries out the row operation. Um, so, um, so it's, it's taking the multiplier, multiplying it by row j, subtracting it from row i. Now, this part is because of the augmented matrix. So whatever we do to matrix A, we also do to the right-hand side B. Um, so that way, the matrix and right-hand side are updated together. So that once we get our final upper triangular system, it's the correct system to apply back substitution to. Now, um, so, so that is the whole algorithm. So for each column, then for each row below the diagonal, carry out the row operation. And we do this in this element by element fashion. <clears throat> now, I have three minutes. But that's enough time to make a key point here. Notice here I said for k going through for the entire row, if you want to operate on the entire row, k would vary over all columns from 1 to n. But notice I didn't do that here. I started from column j plus 1 all the way to the end. Why is that? 
there's two things at play here. First of all, in this row, keep in mind, I've already worked on columns to the left. Um, so I'm going to write this down. Okay. In the notes here. Really, we only need to work on columns k plus 1 to n. So in columns, oh, it's not, not k plus 1, j plus 1. So in columns, stop that, 1 up to j minus 1, Those entries have already been made zero from working on previous uh, columns. Um, so there's, we, we, we just be linearly combining zeros. So there's just, there's just nothing to do there. Um, dang thing. Okay. Now, the last point, though, um, in column J, there's no need to explicitly update AIJ because <coughs> this process here, what does it make AIJ equal to? Zero. That's the goal. So why actually have the computer perform this multiplication and subtraction for a result that we already know is, uh, we already know it's going to be wasted operations? Um, no, it will become zero. Okay. <coughs> now, when I've had students implement. Okay. What's that noise I'm hearing down there? Oh, okay. It's in the hallway. Oh, okay. Um, well, dang, I need to keep it down. Um, okay. Okay. Anyhow, oh, I'm out of time. But um, so, if, so what happens here is, um, okay. So when I have students actually implement this algorithm exactly in MATLAB, so then they go ahead and run it on a, on a matrix. I and mean, they think it's wrong because the matrix does not come out upper triangular. Um, and, but it turns out it's still correct. It just didn't work on entries it didn't need to work on. Uh, the portion of a matrix in the upper triangle is the correct output. It's just that there's all this gobbledygook left in the lower triangle because nothing there was set explicitly to zero. And it could be ignored. Um, so once this... Uh, algorithm is completed execution, then the resulting system is upper triangular, and you can apply back substitution to it. And back substitution would only inf um, if you look at the algorithm here for back substitution, it touches entries u i j, uh, where i is greater than or equal to j. So rows greater or equal to column only the upper triangle. So whatever junk is left in the lower triangle would not be used by this algorithm anyway. So you still get the correct um, uh, solution. OK, sorry I've run two minutes past time, so I'm definitely stopping now. But I will continue talking about solving systems and LU decomposition, which is equivalent to Gauss elimination, uh, over the next few classes. OK, so let me.